The aim of this lecture is to talk about the intestine, specifically the small and large intestine. The small intestine commences right at the exit of the stomach. So here is the stomach that we looked at in the last video. This is the pyloric region where it contains the pyloric sphincter. Different regions of the small intestine are the duodenum, jejunum, and the ileum. Green, blue, and red in this image. And then we'll look at the large intestine, which contains the appendix, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, sigmoid colon, leading into the rectum and the anus. So before we get into the details of the small and large intestine, I think it's important to talk about surface area because surface area is significantly important, mainly in the small intestine where the great majority of absorption occurs. So the more surface area the small intestine has or anything has, the greater ability there is to carry out any activity. So if we're talking about digestion, specifically in the small intestine, that is absorption of nutrients from the chyme into our bloodstream. So the goal for the small intestine is to have as great a surface area as possible within a confined space. And when we're thinking about surface area, within the realm of human anatomy, we have to incorporate the idea of a confined space because if we stretch out the intestines, it's many meters long, but we don't have that amount of space within the abdominal cavity. So we have to make use of different surface modifications to increase the surface area. So what we have here, we have three black lines, one, two, three. So between them is a space they should be the same distance. I didn't measure this out. The units don't matter. This could be inches, millimeters, meters, feet, what have you. But what I'm trying to show here is this pink line goes from the first line to the second line. Now, if we look at the green line, it's going twice the distance as the pink line. If we are confined by just the first two lines, if, we're, if we are confined by this, just this space, one might think that the surface area has to be limited to this length of the pink line, but there can be undulations in the green line or the pink line to increase surface area within that confined space. And this is what we have right here. So there, there's that initial green line and to fit it within that confined space between the first two lines is by creating these undulations or waves in that membrane or that material. So this all represents the surface area of this green line. So we are increasing the surface area by creating these undulations or modifications of that particular membrane or tissue. And we've seen this with cells throughout the body. So if we have a cell like this, this represents that initial pink line making up a cell. So around the perimeter of this cell, is the extent of that surface area. We are confined by cells of this size, at least in this particular example. So how do we increase the surface area of this cell? By creating those same undulations or rhythmic or wave-like pattern, in this case of that plasma membrane. So now this cell theoretically has twice the surface area is the previous cell just by creating these surface modifications. If we look at two cells here, and we're looking at theoretically the same cell. These are simple columnar epithelial cells. And what I've shown on the left, the apical surface of the cell has these undulations that are referred to as microvilli. And the whole purpose of microvilli is to increase surface area of the apical surface of a cell so it can absorb more things or potentially even secrete more things. Generally, when we look at that, it looks more like what we have on the right. These are also representing microvilli, but on a smaller scale. So this is certainly undulations of the plasma membrane, but this is more what we see through a microscope. It looks like projections coming off the apical surface of the cell. And this is significantly important for the intestines, specifically the small intestines, because a lot of the cells of the small intestines known as enterocytes have the surface modifications known as microvilli. Okay, so once again, we're gonna look at the small intestine right now, which in this image is green, blue, and red. 
the duodenum, the jejunum, and the ileum. And I have color coded these duodenum, jejunum, jejunum, and ileum in green, blue, and red. The great majority of the small intestine is made up of the jejunum, followed by the ileum, and then the duodenum is duodenum is maintains the shortest length of these three. The duodenum, once again, is the portion of the small intestine closest to the stomach. The ileum is the portion furthest away from the stomach. You could also say the ileum is the portion of the small intestine closest to the large intestine. It's the portion of the small intestine that meets up with the large intestine, specifically with the cecum. There are a number of digestive enzymes within the duodenum, but those digestive enzymes are coming either are coming from the pancreas. In addition to that, we have bile coming from the liver and the gallbladder. And we'll discuss those. We'll discuss bile and those enzymes in a different video. The duodenum also contains Bruner's glands, which secretes a solution filled with bicarbonate, which is meant to neutralize any gastric juices that come into the sw small intestine. Those gastric Juices could be very harmful to the mucosa of the duodenum. So the whole point of this alkaline secretion is to neutralize the gastric secretions or the pH of the duodenum. And when we're talking about the small intestine and large intestine, please keep in mind it's following the same layers of the wall of the intestine as we outlined in the previous video. That is to say the innermost layer contains the mucosa, Outside of that or underneath that is the submucosa, then the muscularis externa with the longitudinal and circular layer, and then outside of that is going to be the serosa. The ileum also contains structures known as pyres patches, which are congregations of lymphatic and immune cells. But the big take-home message from the small intestine is it utilizes four different mechanisms to increase surface area to allow for the greatest amount of absorption as possible of nutrients, minerals, vitamins, water, what have you, into our bloodstream. The first mechanism is length. So the small intestine is dramatically longer than the large intestine. So the longer the length, the greater the surface area, kind of like what we looked at with the green line versus the pink line. But we are still confined by space within the abdominal cavity. So the small intestine incorporates three other aspects to increase surface area. And they are the circular folds, which are, which are ridges that run around the circumference of the small intestine, not the length, the circumference. So circular folds, villi, which are finger-like projections, we'll look at these, and microvilli, which we looked at previously and we will look at again. The modifications aimed at increasing surface area in the small intestine, once again, are the great length, the circular folds, the villi, and the microvilli. So let's take a look at these. Okay, so what we're looking at right here is just a portion of the duodenum, and we know it's the duodenum because this right here is the pyloric sphincter of the pyloric region of the stomach, which is the distalmost aspect of the stomach, and leaving the stomach is the duodenum. We can see the duodenum here has, has a frontal plane or a frontal section on it. So we see the interior and these are representing the circular folds that move around the circumference of the duodenum. And the whole pur purpose of the circular folds is to increase surface area. It's also causing the chyme to proceed through the duodenum in a spiral-like fashion, which is going to slow down the movement of the chyme and as a result, allow for greater absorption of nutrients, vitamins, minerals, water, what have you, into our bloodstream. So the circular folds are the second mechanism for increasing surface area. These are ridges along their circumference of the duodenum. Now, the mucosa of the small intestine is peppered with villi, and these are the finger-like projections. So this is incorporated within those circular folds. So as those circular folds, those ridges go up and down, all that mucosa has these finger-like projections protruding into the apical surface or into the lumen of the duodenum. So that's what we see right here. This is one villus right here, and this is another one right here. So the base of the 
mucosa would be roughly right here. And these are finger-like projections that are protruding into the lumen. Like the entirety or like most of the digestive tract, we see simple columnar epithelial tissue. This is connective tissue beneath it. And if we take a closer look at this, you can see all of these simple columnar cells and each of these columnar cells are peppered with microvilli to increase the surface area of each individual cell. So the villi increase surface area of the entire mucosa and the microvilli increase surface area of each individual cell. So once again, the length of the small intestine, the circular folds, the villi and the microvilli are mechanisms for increasing surface area and improving the ability for overall absorption in the small intestine. These modifications are greatest in the duodenum and jejunum where we have most absorption. Each of these individual cells are known as enterocytes. They have a lot of mitochondria because there is a lot of active transport incorporated within the process of absorption. In addition, what we don't see in this image are a number of goblet cells, which is secreting mucus into the lumen of the small intestine. In addition to that, we have what, what are known as intestinal crypts in this area. So like I said, this level would be roughly the surface of the mucosa, or at least the base of the villi, the finger-like projections. And these intestinal crypts are very similar to the gastric glands that we saw in the stomach. And they're going to help produce a number of things like the antibacterial enzyme known as the lysozymes. And they're also responsible for housing some of the good bacteria that produce a number of the essential vitamins that we symbiotically use with the bacteria. Okay, so this image is just once again to highlight the mucosa of the small intestine. So we have these circular folds which curve around like this. These are the humps of these circular folds. Then we have the villi right here. And within the villi, there would be the individual cells, the enterocytes containing the microvilli. So length, circular folds, villi, and microvilli. We don't see microvilli in this image. Okay, let's take a look at colon, which is going to include the appendix, the cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. So to be clear, the reason this is referred to as the ascending colon, because this is the direction of the chyme. It's moving this direction. So keep in mind, chyme's moving through the duodenum, through the jejunum, through the ileum, and then up the ascending colon. It is moving towards the head. It is moving superiorly. Then it moves across the body from right to left. Keep in mind, this is the right side of the body, specifically the right side of the large intestine, specifically known as the right colic flexure. And the chyme is moving across the body to the left side of the body, where it then starts to move inferiorly. So this is where we start calling it the descending colon. And then the descending colon terminates in an S-like pattern that is referred to as a sigmoid colon, which then is going to give rise to the rectum and the anus. So once again, large intestine, cecum, appendix, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, and the sigmoid colon. So the appendix is somewhat um, elusive to us in understanding their true role of it. There are some lymphatic and immune cells congregated in there, and it probably also harbors some of the good beneficial bacteria. So once again, there is good bacteria and bad bacteria. There are, like I said, antimicrobial enzymes that are aimed at, or antibacterial enzymes that are aimed at eradicating any of the bad bacteria, but we absolutely rely on a number of bacteria that are beneficial to our digestive system and our livelihood. And we refer to those as beneficial or good bacteria. Once again, like I said previously, the great majority of absorption occurs within the small intestine, though there is to a certain degree some absorption of water and ions from the large intestine. The main function, function of the large intestine is to compact the chyme into fecal matter that in, eventually will be 
eliminated or defecated from the body. And the last thing I want to talk about with specific to the small and large intestine and really the whole digestive tract is the enteric nervous system. And this is a nervous system specific to the digestive tract. It's composed of over 100 million neurons. It can function independent of our body's central and peripheral nervous system. And specific to this are the Meisner plexus and the Auerbach plexus. The Meisner plexus is embedded within the submucosa of the layer of the digestive tract. Once again, we have the mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, and the serosa. So the Meisner plexus is embedded within the submucosa along the digestive tract. And the Auerbach plexus is a group of neurons that is interdigitated between the different layers of the muscularis externa. So that would be between the circular and longitudinal layer of the small and large intestine and between the circular longitudinal and oblique layer of the stomach. So the enteric nervous system is independent of any other part of the nervous system in the body, or I should say is capable of operating and functioning independent of the CNS and PNS. But that's not to say that it always does. The autonomic nervous system, specifically parasympathetic activity and sympathetic activity can also modulate the neurons within the enteric nervous system.